Hi there and welcome to or back to Lorena's Labyrinth and welcome to part two of exploring unhelpful thinking styles. Um, we revisit how to turn negative thought patterns into positive thinking and harness the power of the mind and um, this way we can become the drivers of our own destiny if you like because we can drive our decision making to achieve the goals that we set or that are our preferred options. So just a reminder that last week we talked about people being either top down or bottom up processes, which means that they are able to unpack their thoughts. Some people, the bottom up processes feel a feeling, a sensation or emotion first, and then that um, is becomes where they explore the originating thought. For other people, they're top down processes and they experience the thought first and then they feel the emotion that's associated with the thought. So the other thing too is whether a person is a bottom up or a top down processor, and we did discuss this last week, um, most of the ideas, beliefs and all the rest of it, they lie below the conscious surface and quite often they're automatic and they happen very quickly, which is why we have to unpack them uh, or unpack the process to find out what is, what is referred to as the hot thought, the triggering thought that triggers large emotional reactions, especially when it leads us to undesirable circumstances. And obviously last week, and I'm just revisiting this, um, if you haven't actually watched the first video, I do recommend that you do because that becomes an introduction into why we're doing this. But if this is your first video, the point being that feelings are not thoughts and we have to unpack them to be able to separate them. And basically our thoughts, well, our feelings, our emotional reactions are related to how we perceive a situation and often our perception is inaccurate um, and it's based on this internal perhaps flawed emotional processing or a flawed thought that lies underneath it all but either way you'll learn more about that by looking at last week's video the weeks before we discussed emotional um, processing we focused on emotions and we learned how to name them, how to identify if they're primary, secondary or tertiary reactions as well. Um, but anyway, the idea of separating and differentiating between feelings and thoughts is because this way we can work out what is called the hot thought, the trigger. And it's this that creates those large uh, distressing reactions that I've talked about. So hot thoughts are also called the activating thoughts and we did explore this last week as well and we talked about the different uh, reflective processing tools, you know, being able to unpack emotions and this is why I've put these um, images up on this slide here is so that you can find them in the playlist because we've got the unpacking emotions is where you learn to name the emotions and of course when we talk about the reflection we're talking about the Gibbs reflective framework and I run through that with you but last week's I talk about how to differentiate with the activating thought and the consequence and then we look at the belief that created the consequence. We've also discussed, and just a refresher here, um, before we go into the actual unhelpful thinking styles, we talked about thought discovery, which is that process of identifying the um, hot thought. But then we talked about doing detective work on it and really establishing what is the credibility of this belief or perception? And is there something wrong with the way that I'm processing or is there other ways that I can address it or look at the situation? So I'm just putting this up here because this is what we're going to be using to challenge the unhelpful thinking styles that we're going to be looking at today. So I did show you this list of unhelpful thinking styles last week as well, but I'm going to talk more about it today and I'm certainly going to break it down and try and give examples where possible as to uh, what each of these looks like. Now, the reason why they're called unhelpful is because when they get really large or when they're creating problems in a person's life, meaning um, they have really negative adverse impacts on the emotional state and then they're considered to be very problematic and we've got to look at doing change there now of course the way you apply this within um, 
life is contextual okay if we're in a psychiatric facility or working with people that um, are significantly unwell we're going to take a different approach um, to challenging thoughts because not everybody copes well with having their thoughts challenged but in day-to-day -day living where people have a certain amount of function to them we certainly can challenge them and uh, this is the thought beliefs and if we've got somebody that is close to us perhaps we're in a relationship with somebody and we find them exhibiting some of these behaviors um, you could have a conversation with them about their thinking processing and talk about how you can help them but it's always, I must say, it's always easier to see it in other people than it is within ourselves. But anyway, without further ado, we're going to take a good look at uh, mental filter today. I'm going to try and get through as many as I can within this video so that I can move on to other ones. But um, we'll definitely be looking at least at mental filter and jumping to conclusions today. So a mental filter is where we sort of zoom in on a particular situation and it's kind of tunnel vision like, you know, where you're only looking at one part of the story and ignoring the rest of it. Now, it's not always about um, looking at the negative of something. Sometimes it can actually be these rose tinted glasses or goggles that people talk about. You know, all this stuff could be going on around the person. There could be all these warnings that are happening, you know, like, you know, red flag, red flag, but people ignore the red flags because they're focused only on that one aspect but then of course for other people it's the focusing in on the negative and not seeing the green flags I guess so when we've got a mental filter we're just focused on one part of the information but not the whole story and this tunnel vision impacts and influences the whole way that we feel around that situation especially if we're filtering out the important stuff so sometimes when we're talking about challenging this it's useful to process what we consider to be important but we also need to take a more expansive uh, view or vision of the situation so in a simple way of how this um, impacts on emotions right let's say you you've gone out for dinner with your partner you have a disagreement about whether or not to leave a tip um, you decide to stew on the disagreement in the car on the way home feeling that your partner should have done x away the way that you wanted it to happen um and then the idea is to reflect on this you know how would you feel what would be the emotions involved with that because there's going to be an emotion um attached to this you know up until uh, the point where you were leaving the tip you may have actually had a really good night thoroughly enjoyed yourselves and connected um, very well it might have been a very positive um, step for the relationship to go out for dinner but by the time you get in the car and you come home when you've got this focus purely on this one aspect this little disagreement that's occurred over the tipping and that's actually then tainted and flavored your whole emotional experience of the night so when we have a more expansive view we actually balance it all out we balance the good with the negative and when we focus on the negative aspects of anything if we fail to see the good well then these are the kind of experiences and i'm talking about emotional experience as well we will continue to have until we learn to focus on the bigger picture so when um you see on the notes here am i taking all the information and in into account what else is going on that i'm ignoring now i'm going to use a scenario on the next uh, slide to describe what this looks like uh, because there's one in the public forum at the moment or the public domain and let's just go there so just to start with and to be clear this is not a real photograph of Meghan Markle it's an AI generated artwork that I created and I believe it's really good to uh, for us within the context of this video to speak to her and her current situation because both she and her husband have identified in the public forum that they experience um, at least temporary um, 
that would be debatable, symptoms of mental illness. Now, while Megan hasn't disclosed the nature of her conditional diagnosis, there may be people that will turn around and say to me, that's not true, she hasn't, she's not got a mental illness. Well, the fact of the matter is, she stated in the public forum that she attempted to ask um, to take her life. Now, the reality is, whether she did or whether she didn't, because of course there's people that disbelieve her and people that believe her, the fact of the matter is if she's got to that point, she's obviously uh, suffering from some significant anxiety or significant depression at the time to get to that state. And of course, if you've got anxiety and depression, it doesn't mean that it's permanent. But then on the other hand, if you follow the uh, belief that some people say, which is that they believe that she has been emotional and manipulative within this and fabricated that she's lied, well, that could be true too, because of course we don't know, we're speculating. And that would be indicative of one of the symptoms of multiple personality disorders. When I say multiple, I mean any range of diagnoses. So what I'm going on is the fact that she has said that yes, she's attempted to do um, the self-harm, attempted suicide, and this is how I reached this uh, perspective that she does have an illness. Now, the other thing that I want to bring to light here with um, both her and Harry, is this business where people get very confused and they're like, you know, they're so focused on, but it's true, it true, it is true for them. And so therefore it's their truth. And everybody's like, well, how do they come to that? Well, they come to that because they are using a mental filter and they're focused on one aspect. Now, what I can tell you from the perspective of somebody working in a clinical setting um, with people with significant uh, mental illness is that we encourage a person to embrace their emotions and feelings and we say to them you know even if what it is that they feel is based on flawed thinking the emotions are true the feelings are true it doesn't mean that the idea or the belief behind the feeling is true or accurate and we within the context of mental health workers we would be challenging their thinking when they are at that stage when you know because obviously if you challenge it too soon it can actually trigger more symptoms or escalate the symptoms or whatever so it's all about timing and context so we have to be careful when we challenge uh, people's thinking so just putting that out there what i see when they turn around and say well that's our truth means that they have got their mental filter on and they have not challenged the thinking process behind it. They're not taking that expansive vision. And this is the bit that people get frustrated with. And I think this also is indicative that on a social level, there's a lack of awareness about what happens with mental illness as well. So within the context of them, I'm only going to stick to the one scenario here and break it down because this has become so contentious and controversial. It just drives most people insane. Um, you know, just watching on the peripherals, it's kind of like, gee, do we have to have this stuff all over the the news, you know? Um, the, so I'll stick with the, you know, most people are aware if they're not, um, that there's this great big divide between the um, Harry and Meghan supporters and the William and Catherine supporters. It's become quite competitive and really quite distasteful, um, you know, especially with the sugars that have basically you may as well say they have accepted and not challenged the thinking process of what was exposed in the 2021 interview with oprah winfrey so to remind everybody what happened in 2021 was the couple had an interview with oprah and during the course of the interview um megan made oh i think that not made she made some comments that inferred in the interview that there was racism in the royal family the british royal family and uh, where they didn't accept black people which of course offended people everywhere now of course she has denied it um, but then they've been recorded elsewhere as having said um, that this is the case and i believe megan has actually stated for the record that she wouldn't name the people that were the alleged racists in the family 
So if we look at this mental filter, you know, and ask some of these questions of, you know, if we were doing the detective work, if we went to the next stage of challenging the thinking, we would be asking, you know, okay, she said that the activating situation of if we're looking at ABCs is that there were questions by members of the royal family um, around what colour the baby's skin would be. And, you know, the bottom line is that... Um, that would support her belief that the chil that the royal family are racist. However, to be clear, okay, she has perceived these comments as being racism, and yet most of us that have had children, um, whether or not we're married to somebody that's darker than us or whatever, we will ask the questions if we're white. Um, you know, will the children look like the father? Will they look like the mother? Are they going to have the parents? Um, if it's a redhead, will the child be born with red hair? Um, will it not? I mean, for instance, in my own family, we have redheads going back. I've got great aunts and that. And I wondered if I would have a throwback redhead. You know, but then on the children's father's side, there was a lot of dark skin and very dark eyes. Um, so it's normal. And Chris, uh, to question what the baby's going to look like, this is what most of us would believe. And I believe Chris Rock, actually, I saw him say that in his experience and belief is that it's not racism because even in black families, and these were his words, the parents asked the same questions about uh, children that are going to be the products of a mixed marriage like you know well what are they going to look like how white is their skin going to be so it's very normal to speculate about uh, what a child will look like so that's the first thing that's the activating thing is um, Megan has taken a perception and she stated this is her truth because they were her feelings and those feelings have not been challenged obviously in a therapeutic setting for her to be able to expand the vision she's still focused on that tunnel vision perspective i believe or we can infer from media so if we were going to be challenged that we would do the how do i know that my thoughts and beliefs are true i'm not megan so i've got to speculate um that part of the reason that she might come to that conclusion is because she was treated differently to other members of the royal family and i would suspect that she was treat um comparing herself to the treatment received by princess catherine of wales now obviously for those of us that are outside of the scenario we kind of go well that's logical and rational because at the end of the day um, catherine is married to the heir to the throne and they are not equal they will never be equal in rank um and despite the fact i think um perhaps megan was given a false sense of security because she was invited to co-chair she and harry i can't remember the name of the charity but i did see an interview where all four of them were sitting there and they were going to be the face of the charity but i suspect what megan didn't take into account is that she would have been invited and so would have harry as part of helping them feel included and not redundant because at the end of the day um as harry has said in his book you know he is or was the second in line to the throne um of course nobody used to call him the spare i think his mother might have called him the spare actually but either way the invitation was a courtesy from the family to assist her i believe um, to feel more comfortable so then we look at well are there facts that um, i'm ignoring or overlooking you know if we were megan we're pretending to be megan um well it would be catherine is the princess of wales and the royal family is an institution and within that institution you obviously have a hierarchy with the queen or the monarch being the ceo and then you've got the two ic which at the time would have been king charles and then um there's no negotiating the the line um the I can't remember what it's called who's going to be next in line to the throne it's going to be william you know there's no um oh well maybe it'll be harry because he's a better person or whatever that's not how royalty works it's an inherited title it was always going to be william and it will remain as william so within the context of this as much as megan might have thought that she was an equal and would have liked to have been um center stage that is not possible because you are talking about tradition rank and where traditions are that she would have to curtsy obviously to William and to Catherine 
um, as time goes by. Not while um, not while the Queen was alive. Um, I don't know if they would need to do it now. I'm not that full up on traditions, but obviously at some point in time, at the very least, when William becomes king, they will both have to curtsy and bow. So, you know, then we would challenge this a bit more. What other explanations could there possibly be? Well, the other explanations I've already discussed is that perhaps the comments were being made based on curiosity and interest and potentially an excitement over the merging of genes um, and what that might mean for Meghan and Harry, you know. And then the other thing is the question, if we were talking about how realistic are my thoughts, beliefs and expectations, well, clearly the belief that the family is racist because they ask questions on skin colour is evidentially not true um, and expectations to be treated the same as William and Kathleen are unrealistic because under the best of circumstances it's never going to happen um, because they are outranked by Catherine and William. So I think within the context of me answering some of these questions here we've actually taken in this business of am I taking the information into account all of it and what else is going on that I'm ignoring you know there would be that too and I mean it could have been even worth asking a question by the couple towards the family about what life might look like for them in the family and in fact I think they did because that would have um, been part of their decision to remove themselves because obviously they wanted this front line it would appear they wanted to be the front line of uh, the royal family and in the public eye. So last week we did talk about assumptions being um, a very unhelpful thinking style because quite often we make these assumptions and we're incorrect and I put up here on this slide the saying you know to assume because it's a saying I got told years ago many years ago actually to assume is to make an ass of you and me okay because when we assume we're making conclusions we're drawing conclusions without any substantiating facts and they could be completely wrong so the problem is that the more we do this jumping to conclusions and assumptions without anything to support it um, it can be really depressing um, depressing well that too but it can be very distressing especially if this becomes a habitual behavior where we jump to these conclusions we make assumptions based on what we think a person is thinking right that's the mind reading or what we think they're going to do which is the predictive thinking um, because it's not necessarily based on reality so when we talk about mind reading okay of course we talk about um, the assumption there is that we know what somebody's going to do or, or what they're thinking rather because that's the mind reason if I can speak the mind reading is when you think you know what a person is thinking okay and I'm sure we all do this kind of thing at different times with our family especially as we're very familiar with those close to us with their body language and their behaviors we might be able to read those people close to us to a certain level but not necessarily with complete accuracy either because I'm sure you as well as me at different times has um, seen our friend partner loved one and laughed and gone I know what you're thinking and they turn around they go what do you think I'm thinking because your friends or mates you've got that in intimacy and you can say you were thinking x y and z and they come back and they go ah no you're wrong right I was thinking x and y and you're like oh okay all right because you're friends it's not a big deal but when um, the relationships are more distant or they're new friendships and associations and we start making those conclusions without having any evidence supported to it, it can really take us down a distressing pathway. The other problematic thinking here is uh, when we believe we think what that we know what that person's going to do and that's called the predictive thinking and it's like yes yeah I know what you're going to do you're going to do x and y okay and the reality is often far different from um, the actual perception 
So without going on to a different slide, let's take a look at uh, what mind reading might look like. So as an example, you're sitting next to somebody um, and you're trying to engage them in conversation, but they keep looking at their watch. They're not really paying attention to what you're saying and you feel that they're a bit absent from the conversation. So you think you know what they're thinking because you think they think you're boring, okay? But they don't. What you don't know, right, um, because you haven't asked, right? How do I know this person is thinking I'm boring? We ask these questions, we challenge the thought um, because they're looking at their watch and they're distracted. What are some alternative explanations for this? Well, they might have an appointment coming up or they're expecting a call and that's the first thing. And then the other thing is, if I was feeling differently, would I still think this? Because often the assumption or the thought is based on how we're feeling on that day. So let's say that you're having a bit of a low day or just feeling a bit sensitive that day and you sit next to somebody and they're looking at their watch and, you know, you take that personally, you get a bit sensitive about it and it's like, well, they're looking at their watch because they're bored to tears with me, they don't want to be with me. Um, but the reality is actually, you know, they're waiting for a phone call or whatever. Um, would you take it as so personally or sensitive if you were sitting next to them on a different day, you know? Um, if you were feeling more upbeat, would you feel more confident to just turn around and say, are you all right? What are you looking at your clock for? You know, am I holding you up? Am I delaying you from something, you know? You would feel confident to ask the questions. Um, predictive thinking, of course, thinking you know what they're going to do. Of course, that's rife with um, dilemmas as well. And um, instead of putting the attention on somebody else for this example, let's talk about predictive thinking within um, the context of yourself, say. So let's say you've got an important, um, important event to go to and you might have to, it might be an interview or something like that, and you think, I just know I'm going to blow this, I'm going to muff it, you know, because I'm very self-conscious, I really want this job, and I guarantee you I'm going to stumble over my words or I'll do something really stupid when I'm in there and I'll blow it, okay? Now, the problem is that when we do this kind of predictive thinking for ourselves, we actually tend to fulfill our own predictions. But if we go in there and we're positive um, and feel upbeat and we're more relaxed about it, then we tend to present better because we're not so anxious when we go in because the anxiety tends to cloud uh, processing and obviously performance, you know? So the question there would be, well, how do I know I'm going to go in there and muff it? You know, because I've got anxiety. You know, what are some other explanations for this? It doesn't necessarily apply to the predictive thinking, um, but you could do that if I was feeling differently, would I still think this? Um, if I was calm, would I think this? If I was doing my breathing, would I still feel that I was going to muff it? You know what I mean? You can do some activities there to actually change the outcome for yourself. So the key to these is actually catching yourself when you think you know what another person's thinking. You don't stop that. Um, if you think you know what another person is going to do or the outcome of a situation before it happens, you don't, okay? You don't know until it happens or until it is um, said to you. And the thing is, too, just so you know, because obviously I do the psychic development as well, this is actually the same for people who do psychic work, okay? You don't know what that person is thinking, even if you've got a crystal ball, okay? Because unless you've asked them, you don't have consent to read their energy anyway. Sorry about that for the people that are not into spiritual stuff. Um, so that little last bit I gave you is not clinical stuff. That's actually personal experience working in energy fields. Just because you think you know what that person is feeling or what they're going to do doesn't mean that they will. Okay, same deal. I'll go into that in a different video. So I'm going to try and keep the videos a bit shorter this week and instead of dragging this out, I've just noticed it's gone for half an hour. So I'll start next week talking about personalization and if I can speak, catastrophizing. And if I can, I'll do some more. I'll talk about some more thoughts. 
uh, or unhelpful thinking styles. But for now, I'll just turn around and say, you know what, I really hope that I've been able to add benefit to your life today and I will catch you on the next video. Thanks for being part of my journey. Have a good one. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye for now.